This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is Paul Tremblay. And Paul is a long-time friend of the podcast, so it was great to get him back on the show. We especially spoke about his new release, The Paul Bearers Club, and the forthcoming M. Night Shyamalan adaptation of The Cabin at the End of the World, Knock at the Cabin. Now, Paul is definitely one of those must-read authors within horror, right up there with the likes of Stephen Graham Jones and Josh Malaman, to name but two more. And it was his breakout novel, A Head Full of Ghosts, that really got him on the horror scene. But, of course, for long-time fans of Paul Tremblay, you'll know that there are a number of crime novels that he wrote before that. So, I mean, I do implore you to... Check out a load of his back catalogue, see what you can track down, because it's always a treat reading Paul Tremblay. It's always a treat chatting to him as well, so I really think you're going to have a lot of fun with this one. But before any of it, a little bit of an advert break. Hey horror fiends, it's Tim Levin here from the UK. I'm delighted to be an author guest at Horror on Main. Really hope you can join us there, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be scary. There's going to be lots of books for sale. Oh, it's going to be glorious. So I hope, really hope to see you there. I'm looking forward to it so much. Be scary. Keep reading. Be safe. Horror on Main, a new weekend convention for the horror community. We've been going to conventions for over 20 years and are changing up the little things to make the big picture amazing. Join us Memorial Day weekend 2023 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Come to the block party and meet your new neighbors. See HorrorOnMain.com for details. Tried and true or done to death. It was all a dream. An anthology of bad heart tropes done right revives even the most exhausted cliches with stories from some of Hart's biggest names like Gemma Files, Gabinio Glacius, and Haley Piper. It was all a dream. An anthology of bad heart tropes done right. Available anywhere you buy books online. Use this code, This Is Horror, for 20% off through the month of October when you order direct from HungryShadowPress.com. Okay, with that said, here it is. It is Paul Tremblay on This Is Horror. Paul, welcome back to This Is Horror podcast. Thank you. I missed it. <laughs> Or I should say, I miss being on. It's been a while. Yeah, we have missed Which is you. Just sort of obnoxious to say. Sorry. Yeah, like that. I've had the opportunity and luxury to be on multiple times, but it's the truth. Well, not only have you been on multiple times, but I was looking at the stats before recording this episode, and so prior to this, you had <laughs> been on the podcast in ten episodes. So with what? this one, you're going to have been on. 12 times because it will be a two-parter i'm confident oh, okay. to say parters okay yeah yeah, yeah. That, that's what we've done we've done two <laughs> parters see. and three parters so you've been right. on 10 episodes so i think last time there was disagreement was it you was it stephen graham jones who had been on the most uh-huh. but we can definitely say now that you are the <laughs> most featured guest on Yay. this is our podcast so Take oh, that, thanks, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. But uh, I, I, I imagine I hope that you'll have Stephen on again soon. Because I'm sure like by the time we finish recording this episode, he'll have probably written another two or three books <laughs> w- w- within that time. It is very likely that that will have happened. <laughs> and, you know, and unless you kind of hack in and 
kind of stop and deflect the Stephen emails because you don't want <laughs> yeah, him to, yeah. to take over, then, yeah, we'll definitely be getting him back on. But, I mean, y- your first appearance on This Is Horror was episode yeah. 47 in 2015. So we've been doing this dance for seven years now. Yeah, amazing. No, amazing that you guys have been doing it this long as well. Uh, yeah, congratulations. I mean, it just seems to be getting you know, continuing to grow and uh, the podcast itself stronger and stronger. So kudos to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, as this is not just a pat each other on the back episode, unfortunately, (laughs) let's... Here's where we start fighting. Yeah, yeah, we're just going to have a fight now. (laughs) But, you know, I heard you say that you'd taken a year off from teaching so i just wanted to clarify is that this forthcoming year or is that the previous year it's this forthcoming year that uh so yes so in a few weeks instead of going back to school i am not going back to school uh which is a weird kind of nice feeling (laughs) less nice trying to deal with like you know what we're gonna have for health insurance um you know sort of a, a very boring story i won't go into but no i'm very excited uh to see what comes from the year from from no teaching i don't know it's i've uh uh, i guess i'll see my age (laughs) you know i'm 50 i just turned 51 turned like a werewolf um and this is gonna be the first september since i was three years old that i will not be going back to a school right (laughs) yeah yeah Um, because you know i've never had any break i went right from from high school to to college and then two years of grad school and then after grad school i started teaching Yeah, and so, I mean, and as you've just said, I mean, so for as long as you've been writing, and of course, prior to that, you have been teaching, you have been going to school, and you've been putting out these incredibly successful novels. So what was it? What was the impetus that made you say, you know what, I'm going to take a year where I'm actually not teaching? Because you've shown that you can clearly produce amazing high quality work and teach but yeah now now you're going kind of full into the writing yeah well i mean so it's it's positioned as you know i have a one-year sabbatical so they're going to hold my job for me for one year um you know and then i have to let them know if i'm coming back or not um but i have part of it was, was frankly just you know the opportunity arose with the the film adaptation of the cabinet at the end of the world um, you know, they bought the film rights, so you know I felt financially comfortable enough to be able to say, you know what, I'm gonna take, I can take a year off. Uh, I have a novel due to my publisher in in, in May, um, and I will say, as, as I'm getting older, I'm finding I don't quite have the same energy that I used to, uh, and it feels like both jobs are taking up more time. Um, you know, both both the teaching and the writing. Yeah, uh, maybe some of that is like most of us. I spend way too much time on social media, which I I probably need to prune back as well. But uh, I have noticed, like the last few years, like man, this has been it's getting harder and harder to balance both. Um, yeah, so I mean, I really like teaching a lot. You know, obviously, I really like writing. I don't know. I figured, well, you know, I I didn't want to just like also just plunge into writing full time necessarily blindly. Like, let's see what it looks like. You know, who knows? Maybe like come November. <laughs> I've spent too much time in my own brain and I'll be as squirrely as, as the squirrels that are rampaging my, the exterior of my house. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. That does sound pretty squirrely to me. <laughs> and I couldn't come up with a better uh, <laughs> metaphor than comparing squirrels to squirrels. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we should say for anyone who hasn't read Paul's work, this is not reflective <laughs> of his writing. Yes. So please. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Don't be discouraged. <laughs> a lot of squirrels. The next novel, all squirrels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, what are you most excited about with this year away from teaching? Oh, I mean, you know, I'm actually, I'm most excited about the fall. Like, <laughs> I've always loved the fall weather-wise. Um, but, like, you know, as much as I love teaching, you know, this is going to sound like a, a lame complaint, but it's kind of hard to go back after having months off. And I know no one's shedding any tears for me that only have like 
particularly if you're in the United States, if you only have like two, three weeks of vacation a year. Um, yeah. So like for me, the fall has always been like, ah, oh, back to school, you know, and after like a week or two, I'm back in the swing of things. But those first two weeks, I'm kind of like professionally depressed. and like, I can't believe the summer's over already. So I, you know, on one level, I'm actually really excited to have a fall where I don't have sort of that feeling. Um, I'm excited and nervous to see what I get accomplished. Like part of what I was hoping to do, and I don't know if the opportunity is going to be there, but I was kind of hoping to maybe try working on some screenwriting stuff, um, you know, at the same time. And, you know, I know that, you know, as you've mentioned, I've been able to teach and write novels and short stories, but I don't know if I can teach, write screenplays and write novels and short stories at the yeah. same time. That, that seemed like a bit much. And like, and if I do dabble in screenplay writing, I don't want it to take away from novels. Uh, those come first in my mind. Like, you know, I'm a novelist first or, or a writer, a fiction writer first and foremost. Um, you know, and I also wouldn't presume to think that I'd be very good at screenwriting. It's a totally different skill set. You know, I'm not going to be great on it right off the bat and it, or ever. Like, who knows? <laughs> so, I mean, that's part, partly, partly what I was thinking about, you know, in sort of planning for this year off. Yeah, and knowing that you now have, like, the full day for your writing and creative endeavors and whatever it is you know, you choose to do with that time. Yeah. Will you be putting a lot of structure and planning into the day? So you've got, I mean, almost like a timetable could, could simulate school in a way, but you probably don't need the bell to go. Oh, period right. one is over Paul. Now it's doing a short story period. Three is yeah. going to be a screenplay, but yeah, are you, are you <laughs> right. putting a lot of structure in? Uh, I'm actually, I'm, it's funny. I just said to my wife the other day that like, I was going to try to, to mimic my school schedule as much as I could, but just have it be for like the writing parts of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, ultimately at school, I would have like three hours worth of classes, you know, with breaks in between, mm -hmm. you know, obviously there's prep time. Um, at my school, they typically make us coach a couple of sports too. For, for to me, that's always been like the biggest time hurdle mm -hmm. is the extra coaching time too. So yeah, I guess the short answer is I am because <laughs> this summer I have not been as successful as, as doling out my, uh, writing time. Like I've been kind of treating the summer like a, a normal summer, but like come to September, if this is my job, I'm going to make sure I, I, I sort of schedule it that way as well. Yeah. We'll see if that works. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe I'll have to go back to letting it be free and loose a little bit in terms of like not necessarily having a rigid structure and just have like, you know, a few hours here and there when I, when I can. So, I mean, that's part of it is let, you know, let's just see if I can figure out like what it would look like, <laughs> you know, writing for a job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned to the screenwriting and of course the adaptation of cabin. So it's mm -hmm. going to be titled no Knock at the Cabin. Of yes. course, M. Night Shyamalan, which is incredible. <laughs> One of the finest <laughs> filmmakers, I would say, mm -hmm. in the world right now. Mm. And, mm. of course, you've effectively been sitting on this and unable to talk about it since I think it was around 2017. So how does it <laughs> feel to finally be able to say some things about it? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's nice. I mean, it was, uh, you know, the, the, the book was first option 2017, but night didn't really come onto the scene until like, uh, like, I mean, he was like a maybe in 2020, but it was really like in the late summer, early fall of 21 was like, Oh, this might actually happen with him. So yeah. So it's been maybe a year where I've been like sitting on some really exciting news. And frankly, it was kind of stressful in the spring, uh, just because, you know, we were going back and forth about, you know, when, when can we talk, what, you know, if people ask and stuff like that. Um, and people are starting to put like two and two together based on, mm -hmm. based on information that night was, you know, leaking out there as, as what he usually does is, you know, teasing his projects. And so for a big chunk of the spring, like I'd get tagged in a Facebook post or a tweet and I'd, you know, message a person like, Hey, you know, I, I appreciate the enthusiasm. But can you take that down? We can't talk about it yet. <laughs> yeah um yeah so i mean it was kind of like a weird thing to be you know sort of policing <laughs> exciting news but uh but that 
but yeah, no, it's good to be able to answer questions now when I'm asked about it. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of your involvement in the project, I mean, how, how closely involved were you in terms of the film? Uh, pretty much not at all. <laughs> um, you know, so, certainly not in any official capacity. Um, you know, I guess my involvement with Knight started with a phone call. I think it was like November of last year, or maybe it was October. Um, you know, I talked to him and, you know, just like an introductory thing. And, you know, you know, I was very, he was very pleasant, very, um, very easy to talk to. He was very complimentary of, about the novel, which was nice. You know, and I was appreciative of how upfront he was about what changes he was going to make. Um, but yeah, other than that, like, you know, he would ask me, like, I would get like random messages from time to time that were kind of fun. Like, Hey, I'm nights actually texting my phone. Like, Hey, he was like, Hey, you know, where, uh, where did you get the design of the weapons from? Like, you know, what, ins you know, what inspired you, you know, for that. And then he would ask me, sometimes I would get questions about, uh, some character motivation and, and stuff like that. And even little things like he wanted to, you know, for some scenes, characters might have needed like a last name <laughs> kind of stuff. So I mean, that was kind of fun just to be like, okay, let's name this person. You know, I never gave any of the other uh, characters like a last name. But yeah, so, but in terms of like screenplay or anything like that, no, I, I had no, no role. Yeah, I was going to ask you if he ever asked you some questions and you were like, oh, well, that's not something I've kind of conceived of yet but it seems like you've already <laughs> answered that that like literally yeah. it's like well did they have a last name and it's like well i guess they will in a few minutes for for <laughs> night <laughs> yeah but i i think i mean it's got a fantastic cast but by the way have you, have you seen the film yet i i don't know like kind no. of what no yeah, and I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Like, if I would get to see an early version, I did get to visit the set for two days in May, which was amazing. They finished filming in that early June. Yeah, you know, so I, I did get to meet the cast, um, and they were very, very nice, very gracious with their time. You know, they had all read the book and were, you know, again highly complimentary, which was really, really cool of them. Um, yeah, Dave Batista is a large human being. Yeah, <laughs> which is an understatement. Um, I've been joking that he's my height, that part's not the joke, but like, you know, he's got like 60 pounds more muscle, yeah. you know, me plus 60 pounds more muscle, like, but to be more accurate, it would be, it's, he's 260 pounds of muscle compared to the 200 of whatever, whatever my body is. It's yeah. not, <laughs> it's not the muscle that Dave uh, Batista has. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it true that the only reason you haven't done a kind of radical transformation, because if that happened, it would then be difficult to logistically compare you and Batista. It's like, well, who, who's who here? Which <laughs> exactly. <one's... laughs> so yeah. you're actually doing Dave <laughs> Batista a favor by not bulking up. Yeah. I don't think he has to <laughs> worry about, uh, about that happening anytime soon. <laughs> but I mean, in, in all seriousness about Batista, I mean, I, I'm a big professional wrestling fan. And for me, oh, it's been yeah. it's been really exciting to see him absolutely dominate pro wrestling, then <laughs> casually just win an MMA fight. He's won one MMA fight and it's like, right, well, I guess I've conquered yeah. that. And then he's gone on to become a legitimate movie star. And I mean, for me, if you look at the quality of his acting, particularly in Blade Runner, I'd say there's a strong argument that he's the greatest pro wrestler turned actor, and I'd put him <laughs> above the likes of The Rock and John Cena. Yeah, no, uh, you know, I might playfully argue about for Roddy Roddy Piper, but I, I knew, uh, I, I knew, I, would... I knew <laughs> one of you would bring Piper yeah, into this. No, <laughs> but that's more just me being a fan of Piper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, he, I mean, he has to carry a lot in this movie. Um, you know, from what I've seen, you know, he's, he's knocking, knocking it out of the park. You know, I got to watch two days worth of, of scene shooting and I, and I got to see some dailies from what they had shot previously. Um, and I think it's just going to be a super intense, beautifully shot and, and, you know, beautifully acted movie. Um, yeah, I can, I feel like I can make those guarantees. Yeah. And I'm I'm excited to see Rupert Grint in it as well because of course so many 
people will just oh, mention Harry Potter and things, but he's right. so much more than that. And I think it was Servant, again, with Shyamalan, yeah. that mm-hmm. he put in a fantastic kind of dark performance in that. He was very good in this uh, kind of dark comedy called Sick Note as well. So he he is a great one to have on board for the project. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I think... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, if you've only seen him in the Harry Potter movies, like his his role and character will be much different uh, in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, was was this happening with the cabin? Was that the impetus for you looking into the screenwriting stuff and y- y- you wanting to explore that avenue? Obviously, getting more immersed and visiting the set or is this an aspiration that was long preceding that yeah uh maybe a little bit of both i don't know about how how much long preceding but also just you know with my you know brief experience with adaptations uh and geez maybe it's not that brief anymore but (laughs) still very much anecdotal where you know a head full of ghosts has been under option since 2015 and that that movie has come close to being filmed a number of times and then things falling apart for one reason or the other, but you know, they're still working at it. Um, you know, and then the, you know, the cabin process, I feel like at the end, it sort of felt like it happened quick, you know, when night came on officially like in 2021, but, uh, you know, but again, they had optioned it in 2017 and there were other directors attached initially. So like each of you know those two experiences has been a process um, and I can't say by who, but Survivor Song has been optioned as well, which is exciting. Um, so part of it is like, you know, like, you know, if I were fortunate enough to get another work of mine, whether it's a short story or a novel, you know, I would like to try being in on the adaptation on some level, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's writing or co-writing a screenplay or if something was, you know, I'm, and I'm talking in total ifs here. There is nothing like I am not uh, like, you know, in a, in a writer's room for like a TV show or anything like that. But I figured, you know, there was something I, I kind of wanted to try to do. I figured if I ever were to leave teaching, I would want, you know, a second writing job for lack of a phrase to sort of take that spot. Like just so I felt comfortable about the whims of the, of the publishing marketing place, you know? Um, so if I could, you know, get some screenwriting stuff going, then maybe I could, you know, leave uh, teaching. Um, so I figured, so with that sort of just rolling around my head for the last few years, you know, with the cabin movie coming, I figured, you know, within this next year, I bet, you know, maybe there'll be another opportunity because the movie's being made, you know, maybe other works might get looked at or I might have an opportunity. Um, you know, one of the things I have been actively doing is I've been working with a couple of young filmmakers on trying to take my short story, The Getaway, uh, and make it into a feature length film and, you know, and we've written like a 20 minute pitch slash treatment that we've been sort of you know, meeting different producers in Hollywood with, which has been a, a wonderful learning experience. I've learned a lot from, uh, the two filmmakers. You know, I'm very appreciative that, you know, they're letting me tag along <laughs> in working on this thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in terms of the screenwriting that you'll be doing, I, I guess from, September is that an adaptation of some of your work like the getaway that you've spoken about or is this yeah. an uh, original what what are you looking at doing so I mean my my plan originally like this was back in the spring was my plan I was kind of hoping like you know the getaway might get my hit somewhere it still might we're, we're just not sure um, it does seem that like a lot of places given uh, given financially what's happening uh, in Hollywood a lot, you know, obviously I, I'm sure you've heard about, you know, HBO max cut, you know, a lot of the streamers are now cutting sort of mm. budgets. And, you know, I, I also can understand like studios are having a harder time, like financing movies or, you know, getting the money kind of thing, you know, especially if it's something that's not, that hasn't had a screenplay written yet. Um, yeah. So I, I have, <laughs> when September starts, I'm not going to be writing a screenplay. I'm going to be working on my novel. Um, You know, maybe hopefully later in the fall, we we play something, whether it's the getaway or, you know, uh, my reps are actively pitching the Paul Bearers Club, you know, as well. 
So, you know, fingers crossed one of those things happens. And if not, that's fine too. You know, I'll have more time to write my novel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in terms of tutelage and in terms of really honing the craft as a screenwriter, who are you kind of looking to or are you getting advice from people or is, is it perhaps these young filmmakers we were talking about or can you send yeah. night a text <laughs> you, I mean, that, that's more a joke but yeah yeah <laughs> um so like you know so before this year and actually it was right before the pandemic hit i for practice as much as anything like you know i was i took it seriously like oh you know if this comes out well i wouldn't mind trying to to push it i took my short story, 19 snapshots of Dennis Port, and wrote a feature screenplay. It's probably less than a feature length. It's, you know, it's probably like 70 minutes or something. Um, you know, my, my, I love that short story, and there's been some interest in it. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't the best short story for me to, to start with because its, its format or its narrative structure is so unique. Like, <laughs> I kind of found myself you know, doing the same thing with the screenplay, and I know most studios want their three acts and want their beats in a certain place, which I'm sort of frankly less interested in as a storyteller. Um, but now, so, but with that screenplay, you know, I've, I've sent it to friends who have experience with screenwriting. So actually the one I probably talked to the most is Sarah Langan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she'll set, she's sent me like some screenplays she's worked on in the past uh, and I've sent her, you know, mine, you know, for critiques and vice versa. Uh, I've also gotten advice in, uh, and sort of mentorship from Alejandro Bruguez, uh, Cuban uh, writer and filmmaker. Maybe uh, his, his first movie that made a really big splash was called One of the Dead, mm. which if you haven't seen, I highly recommend. Um, but he, you know, he, he's also done some work recently. I guess most recently was Nightmare Cinema. He had a segment that you know a movie that Mick Garris had put together, um, and Alejandro just announced that he's working on an adaptation of Gabino Iglesias' new novel, oh, which is really exciting. Perfect. Yeah, so Alejandro is a good friend. And so, and another screenwriter named uh, Matthew Leslie, you know, I sent him the screenplay I wrote and got some feedback from him. So now everyone's been super, like, whenever I ask, people have been unfailingly, you know, nice and, and offering their, uh, you know, offering their criticism and, and help, et cetera. Uh. That's perfect. And I I didn't know about the adaptation of Gabino's work, but that's gonna yeah. be that's gonna be super exciting too. Absolutely. Well I'll tell you something when I was looking into okay, what's going on with Knock at the Cabin, there was one thing that really excited me. I should rephrase that. There were many things that really excited <laughs> me, but that yeah. one thing in particular said sh that Knight has shot the film with a 1990s lens to give it an old-school thriller look. And I thought, oh, shit, that sounds amazing. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I'm really, really in intrigued and excited about how that is going to come out. Yeah, his director of photography, uh, it's so awful, I'm going to forget his name. Um, but his director of photography worked, uh, was the director of photography for uh, Robert Eggers' three movies, The Witch, The Lighthouse, and The, the Northman. Yeah. Um, so it's it's going to be like a beautifully, like as I mentioned, I think it's just going to be a stunningly, visually it's going to be a beautiful movie. Um, yeah, I could see him working on the set, and they were spending a lot of, I think more time than usual uh, than Knight was used to, you know, setting up in between shots. Mm. You know, it's just so, so every shot is actually sort of <laughs> lit perfectly, it, it, you know, curated and, and it looks like, you know, how we saw, uh, how we storyboarded it, et cetera. So yeah, that was, you know, even though I wasn't there very long, it was, it's really cool to sort of see all that stuff at play. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's interesting too, how these things sometimes play out. Cause I imagine, you know, it was pretty frustrating the length of time that it took for you you to have this talk in 2017 and think, oh yeah, it's going to be a movie, but then it's obviously <laughs> taken five years to to transpire. But you know, yeah. to have Knight doing it 
<laughs> it's like, well, yeah, you're going to wait five years to have one of the best <laughs> filmmakers and, and you know, the, I guess the marketing that will go behind that. I mean, it is clearly going to be up there, what one would imagine, with the best horror films of 2023. I mean, obviously, we haven't seen it yet, but we've read the source right. <laughs> material. We've seen what Knight has done before. We've seen, you know, the, the casting. And as you say, Ed, Edgar's director of photography is involved. God, hopefully I'm not going to eat my words, but it will take something to fuck this one up. So yeah. <laughs> re really, it must be just so gratifying and like, oh, okay, th this is why I had to wait so long, but all worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like, you know, there are these like moments of excitement, <laughs> you know, and then they pass, like everything does pass. And it's like, you know, and then you sort of like you remind yourself like, oh man, yeah, this is it happening. So, I mean, I'm, I'm back to it feeling like not real, even though, you know, when I was there for two days, that was like the most surrealistic, uh, and not in a political way in the use of surrealism, uh, surrealism, I'd say, let's say irreal, you know, just being there. So on the, on the, on the set initially, it was just like, oh my gosh, this is nuts. <laughs> uh, like, you know, seeing, you know, Jonathan Groff and, you know, and everybody that was mm. there. Um, and then it's like, yeah, you fly back, go back to school, finish out the school year. I was like, wait, did that really happen? I think it did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm sure there'll be a lot of those moments to come, you know, when, when the trailer first hits and I even allowed myself to say like, <laughs> after seeing uh, nope in the theater and my daughter's like, oh man, when are they going to start showing, <laughs> when are they going to start showing the trailers of, of, of cabin before movies? Like I'm going to, have to go see probably some movie I have no interest in seeing just to yeah. see the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, just stand up in the middle of the cinema like a madman. I wrote that. <laughs> right. I fucking wrote it. <laughs> Sit down and, and shut in, the and fuck up. Read. You're blocking the screen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Bob? I said, in the, yeah, the, they played the trailer. You stand up. <laughs> I wrote that shit. Yeah. Right there, <laughs> and then you leave. I like that idea. Like, like it should demand drop, demand free demand free popcorn or something too on the way out. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the latest release from you is the Pool Bearers Club, and there's so much to say about this one. I'm not even <laughs> sure exactly where to start, but why not start at the beginning? with that opening sentence, I am not Art Barbara, which is a great and interesting way to begin what is surely your most autobiographical book to date. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I, yeah, I, I sort of, I knew that had to, well, at a certain point, I knew that had to be the opening line. Um, yeah, good old Art Barbara. Um, how am I going to describe this? Well, um, I would say in general, and I'll let you ask the questions, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely by far, a lot, I mean, a lot of my stuff is autobiographical or I mean, it's probably more accurate to say that a lot of stuff from your own life, I mean, and you too, I'm sure experience the same thing as writers, a lot of your own experience gets filtered in, into works some t in ways big and small. But, you know, for this book, I definitely rolled around in it quite a bit, you know, purposely so, um, you know, because I felt like it, it fit it fit what I wanted the story to be. Yeah. And I think, I mean, in terms of what the story is, and it, this is the crazy thing that this is even a difficult book to give an elevator pitch or to give a synopsis <laughs> or is. a one liner. It's like, well, there really isn't a one liner, but I mean, it's, <laughs> it's found memoir. There's vampire mythos linked in. It's also <laughs> autobiographical. It's, kind of about well not even kind of it is about our mortality is mm -hmm. <laughs> about growing old um i i think may and, and and also i mean that that's even before we've got to the rather experimental format in which it is told <laughs> but i think be because of the kind of vampire element for those mm -hmm. unfamiliar why don't you tell us a little bit about the legend of mercy brown 
Sure. Yeah. You know, and this is, you know, for anyone who hasn't read the book, it's not a huge spoiler. It gets talked about on page like 60 or something like that. Mm. Um, and well, anyway, so Marcy Brown is a part of this like weird pocket of New England folklore that I'm finding a lot of people know about, but I didn't. <laughs> and I was like, when I discovered it, like when I, and I didn't discover it until I, I had the title for the book and I was looking for some sort of supernatural uh, way into or you know aspect of the story that I hadn't discovered yet. I was like, man, I've lived here my whole life. How did I know? How did I not know about Mercy Brown? So anyway, Mercy Brown is the last known <laughs> uh, New England vampire. Um, she died from tuberculosis in 1892. Um, her mother had died ten years prior. Her sister had died. I forget how many years prior. Um, you know, her older brother was sick. And when Mercy died um, before her brother, the the townspeople and, uh, and they lived in Exeter, Rhode Island. You know, which I mean, Rhode Island's not a very large state, but it was very. It's still rural now. It was you know super rural then. Um, and anyway, um, you know, people in the late even in the late 1890s or late 1800s didn't know what tuberculosis was. They called it consumption. You know, no one knew how it started, what it was, and you know, especially in the rural communities, people assumed it was, it was almost like a supernatural element to the passing of 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 consumption to, from family member to family member, because you know, tuberculosis would just run right through a family. Anyway, um, the locals managed to convince her, uh, Mercy's father, that you know we need to test her to see if she's coming back at night and continuing to feed or or make, you know, her, her brother sick. So the test, and they never use the word vampire. Uh, vampire wasn't sort of attributed <laughs> to Mercy Brown until later. Um, but the test to see if Mercy was coming, you know, returning from the dead at night to feed on her brother, um, they exhumed her body. You, know, you open the chest and look at the heart. If the heart is full of blood, that's a sign that, you know, she's a vampire. You know, we'll, we'll use, I'll use vampire, <laughs> even though they didn't. Um, you know, of course she was somewhat freshly dead. So that's what decomposition does is fills your, you know, your heart fills with, with that settled blood. Um, and the cure was to, so if the heart's full of blood, you take it out, burn it, take, <clears throat> excuse me, you take the ashes, you know, put, put it into water. You know, the brother drank the, the, the heart ash water and that was supposed to cure him, uh, which it did not, but her father never got tuberculosis. Um, yeah. And the, in the, I mean, the other sort of interesting aspect of it, when I said that Mercy Brown was like the last of these New England vampires, these ki- those types of exhumations that I just described, where you know tuberculosis was running through families and people would would you know exhume the deceased to you know to check their heart. It happened. I, th- uh, I hope I have the number right, but I think it's forty times <laughs> by last count. Um, there's a wonderful book on this folklore called food for the dead by uh his last name is bell i don't have the book in front of me so yeah mercy brown um it was wild to me that i could look up articles on this exhumation uh in the providence journal you know still the biggest newspaper in providence rhode island um and obviously you know as they described what had happened you know they described you know the rural uh rural the townsfolk and, and you know super negative T- uh, terms as they probably should have been as being you know sort of superstitious and you know this is ridiculous this is barbarism etc. Uh, but it doesn't seem so long, long ago 1892. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, Art's best friend who who joins the Paul Bearers Club, or he doesn't become his friend until she joins the Paul Bearers Club. Art in his memoir, you know after he said after in the beginning he says I am not a Barbara. You know, he tells the reader very early on in that first chapter that he's changed all the names within the memoir. Mm. Uh, but within his memoir, he names his friend Mercy Brown. Yeah. <laughs> uh, either purposefully or not purposefully, I guess you have to read to find out. Yeah, yeah. And not really a question, but Alan Baxter yeah. wrote on Patreon, Mercy lives in my head now, Paul, but I'll never <laughs> meet her. How dare you? <laughs> so <laughs> poor Alan, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, a lot of mercy is the voice in my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I feel 
I'm sorry, Alan. I'm sorry to have spread that, that uh, <laughs> headworm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in terms of that book, Food for the Dead, so it's by Michael Edward Bell. Thank you, yes. I mean, the clue would have been if you'd have looked at, oh, what's the name of this person I'm talking to? Oh, Michael, yeah. oh, that's the same name. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I remembered Bell. I couldn't remember the first name. Yeah. But it was fine. When I, when I did research, like, you know, of course, there's stuff online, but almost everything I found online, including uh, links in the Smithsonian um, yeah, online archives, all sort of referenced Michael Bell's works. So I was like, oh, I better, I should mm. probably just read his book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's very uh, reminiscent of the seventeenth, sixteenth, seventeenth century. You know, Romanian European. Uh, it's like you, if you read those those you know mm. vampire cases over and over and over, they exhumed the body, and it 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 was not in state of decomposition. Right. And then this has happened when, like nineteen hundreds, right, or, or like late eighteen hundreds. Yeah, late eighteen hundreds. Yeah. And it's like the, it's like the superstitions. The man, they don't die. That's that's what the vampire is. It's the superstition. It's crazy. Yeah, right. And, and I can't remember because I know Michael Bell in his book talks about some of the European superstitions because they they don't quite match one to one. But some of them, like, mm -hmm. like one of the European ones is, oh, their hair was growing longer, which obviously we know happens. Right. Um, and some of them are like you know finding like like vines inside the inside the coffin, growing things. If, if I'm allowed to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it seemed like there was some, for sure, like some overlap, but the fun part also, Michael Bell argues that there isn't, or he could, he, he can't find like a, a sort of a direct line or lineage to either, you know, European folklore or indigenous folklore. Um, and he sort of argues as this weird little New England thing, <laughs> you know, that happened and it happened over and over again in the 18, in the 1700s and 1800s. Well, wow. okay. So that, that kind of ruins that theory, but that's good to know. <laughs> I'm definitely, and definitely, and I've never heard of this book until now. So I'm definitely about yeah. to check it out because I'm working on something with vampires and this sounds like a, some things to pull from. There you go. Nice. Well, of course, in your work, you always take a very wide definition of different tropes and, you know, you really... Mm extend those things beyond what might have been their previously perceived limits. I mean, zombies and survivor sung and, mm -hmm. you know, possession in a head full of ghosts being two of the most obvious examples. Now you're back at it again with the vampire, <laughs> but I wonder, I mean, what is a vampire to you or how would you go about defining a vampire? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, because the fun part is there are like so many sort of types of vampires, and you know, the vampire in, as a sort of a general concept of sort of like a, you know, without defining it, I suppose, as a zombie, where like where it's like a a living dead feeding off the living. Like it's not a zombie going after brains; it's you know, some sort of creature feeding on blood or feeding on energy or you know, all the different. Uh, different sort of iterations within so many different cultures throughout the world. Um, it's interesting that, 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 you know, almost every culture has some form of vampire. Um, so in some ways for me, like the vampire has always been a little bit overwhelming to think about writing a story using a vampire. Um, and our friend and my friend and yours, John Langan for years has been like, when are you going to write a vampire novel? <laughs> like, leave me alone, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he would show off by writing vampire stories, great vampire stories. Yeah. Uh, he has one in his new collection, Corpse Mouth. And I'm forgetting the title of it. I'm sorry, John. I'm so bad with titles. <laughs> but it opens with essentially what's his yard. And there's like this big, you know, if you go in, in John's real life house, like if you go far enough through the backyard, it goes on to sort of like wooded state area. Um, and then there's like this little creek, <laughs> you know, in his is this vampire story opens with, Hey, there's like a big tower thing, or it looks like a tower down at the, down at the Creek. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, maybe it's the kid building, like, you know, one of the neighborhood kids building something down there. And it, you know, ends up being this insane and the best, and I mean that in the best of all, you know, best descriptor, best descriptive terms, insane vampire story. And the bastard even 
in uh, <laughs> I say that lovingly, John, <laughs> uh, in Ellen in Ellen Datlow's final cuts anthology, um, his novella altered altered me, altered you, altered beast, altered you. Again, I butcher titles. Um, it's again a wonderful vampire novella in which I'm the vampire. Um, <laughs> me, <laughs> yeah. which he, 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 which he renamed, he named me uh, Gaetan Cornishon because he's very funny. Um, Cornishon being a little pickle, right? Obviously, mm. so obviously I don't know. Uh. Uh, so anyway, John's like you know, and obviously the wide carnivorous sky from an earlier collection. John's always done like amazing vampire stories. And I don't know, for me, they've always been like, uh, I don't know, weird kind of block. Cause you know, the other books that, especially in the novel form, cause I tend to try to take a trope. And, you know, one of the questions I usually ask myself is how could this really happen? <laughs> you know, how, not to say that there is an invention and in, in supposition and, you know, in the supernatural, but like, I want to try to root it in reality as much as I can. Um, and, you know, I don't do that every time, but typically that's what I've done with my novels, you know, less yeah. so in the short stories. Yeah. So anyway, like when the story for, you know, when I finally sort of had enough to start writing the Palm Bears Club and had Mercy Brown's story, I thought I could have, because of how I was going to approach the story, I thought I could have the best of both worlds where, you know, I am playing it ambiguous as to whether or not something is vampiric or supernatural is happening. Um, but also at the same time, because of the nature of the story, I could get like really weird with it. <laughs> mm. And that, that was, that was a lot of fun, uh, to do as opposed to something like survivor song, where it's yeah, it's zombie adjacent, but I really tried to make the science of it work. Um, you know, in an head full of ghosts, like, you know, if things were happening that supernatural, like I, I didn't go over the top weird. So, so much so that the only explanation for the weirdness was that it had to be supernatural that I didn't think that would have worked in a head full of ghosts. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry, big long rambly answer. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And I mean, I, I've said many a time before that particularly in your novels, I mean, one of their strengths is the ambiguity, the fact that it can be read as both supernatural or grounded solely in reality. You know, I like mm. that because I mean, I just think having it unexplainable makes it more interesting and makes it scarier. I mean, we've said countless times before that when you can explain or when you see the monster, it removes some of that fear. So the fact that you don't know, wait, is this, is this real? Is it supernatural? It only adds to it. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, I share a similar... <laughs> Similar point of view on that. You know, that's not to say you can't have, you know, exp and, and that I, and that I, I mean, I certainly enjoy explicitly supernatural events within, within works too. It's just all, I don't know, it all comes down to me is like what's going to serve the story the best. And, mm. you know, so, so far more times than not with my novels, I've, uh, I've hit upon involving ambiguity in some way. Mm. Um, and, you know, maybe part of it is, you know, especially in a horror story or horror novel, like even if, you know, I'm trying to think of the, uh, well, even if there aren't deaths within the story, like the threat of death is usually there in some way. Right. Um, and then I feel like anytime I invoke sort of an ambiguous element, I, I feel like anytime you're invoking ambiguity, either consciously or subconsciously, like the reader is going to, correlate that in some way to sort of the ultimate ambiguous question that, that awaits us at the end of our life. Right. Mm. Uh, like we don't know what's going to happen when we die. And I think almost all horror stories sort of play with that fear in one form or another, um, you know, at, at its core. I mean, obviously not every story, but so many do. Mm. So I don't know, like, uh, <laughs> it's to me, I mean, it's interesting, the idea that we just don't know. And like, I like exploring that and exploring the ways that, we either cope with it or explore the ways that we convince ourselves one way or the other, you know, what's the truth, what's really happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that a student in your school actually set up a Paul <laughs> Bearers Club, which was the yeah. impetus for this particular strand of the book. And I was wondering, 
Did you talk to that student before writing the book, or have you spoken to them after? It's like, by the way, <laughs> uh, I've talked to his younger brother. Um, <laughs> is that his agent? <laughs> no. Um, you know, he graduated like the spring of 2020, and but that meant it was like all online mm. um, for like three months of it. So. Um, and, and he also like, you know, so he didn't, this particular student didn't invent the Paul Bears club out of whole cloth himself. Like, I feel like I vaguely remember, you know, looking online that there were other, there are other such clubs, you know, elsewhere in the country, um, or, you know, other sort of similar, you know, you're volunteering to serve at a funeral home in the manner that's described in the book, you know, serving elderly and or homeless who don't have a lot of living relatives. Which is a long way of me saying that no, I did not directly. Is that true? I didn't certainly didn't have like a long conversation with him. I think I mentioned to him in passing once. I'm like, hey, I'm going to call my book the Paul Mayor's Club. And he, he, he'd, you know, he had said that, you know, I think they'd only done it like once or twice or something, or he didn't get that many kids to join up. Um, yeah. But <laughs> so then there's even have, more parallels. His, <laughs> right, right. No, I did have his younger brother. I had to help coach the junior varsity baseball team in the spring. And I say that with all the anguish I can in my voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I had his younger brother on the team and I, I told him, it's like, oh, yeah, this book I have come out this summer is something that your brother did. Do you remember that? And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was that conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't for that student. It's a pretty, interesting bit of trivia but perhaps they do not yeah. share share my sentiments <laughs> i will give i'll give him a red i did have him when he was a freshman in my geometry class i'll see if i can give him a retroactive a yeah yeah nice <laughs> idea <laughs> but i mean i think that there were many moments where i knew okay this is fairly autobiographical but perhaps the two biggest pointers were when you mentioned scoliosis and then you just kept mentioning Husker Du um, <laughs> to the point mm -hmm. where every chapter is titled after a Husker Du song. So really, Paul, has this obsession with Husker Du gone too far? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but like, I mean, part of the re a big part of the reason why I, I sort of leaned into the autobiography of it was, you know, so we, we discussed the idea of you know where I caught just even the title of the Paul Bears Club from, uh, and, and thinking about that student who who made the um, who made the announcement and you know tried to start the club, I, I thought to myself like oh man, like if, when I was a senior in high school, there's no way I, I could have done something like that. And right so right off the bat, that sort of interested me. I was like oh all right, so maybe this you know I'm gonna set this you know the start at least in the late '80s where basically uh, an alternate reality media is trying to start this club. Um, because I thought that would be interesting. And also the idea that this story might become a little bit more interior, also a lot more expansive in terms of the timeline compared to my previous two novels, Survivor Song and, and Cabin. Um, that appealed a lot to me. Um, I felt like th those two books sort of almost written like <laughs> one after another in some ways, uh, I don't know. I, I felt like tired after those books insofar as like, yeah, you know, they were kind of stressful to write given that they took a place over such a compressed time period. Um, you know, and, and they so sort of, uh, actively engaged with like the political now. I, was, mm. I don't know. I was looking for something that was going to be different. Like I didn't want to write the same book again. You know, part of that actually was my, you know, us publisher, like, kept shading my stuff more towards like, Oh, you know, calling this a thriller, which is, you know, fine. But like, also like, I'm not writing a thriller every time. Like, you know, I'm a horror writer, <laughs> you know, and there's, I, I want to write all sorts of different types of horror. Um, so anyway, I figured putting me in a story <laughs> uh, would fit the bill and maybe, yeah, taking out the horror on a character that was me instead of other people that I usually, that I usually do was only fair. Right. And having written, I mean, two books back to back that could be classified as thriller, 
And obviously, I guess your publisher being quite keen on that with thrillers being typically easier to market and seen kind of mm. classically at more as a more commercial. Did did you get a lot of pushback and did it actually make this one quite a difficult sell given that it's not like it's it's not a thriller in in the traditional yeah. sense at all and i mean it, i haven't even got to the part about you know notes in the margins yet which but just <laughs> purely in terms yeah. of what it was about i mean is your publisher trying to push you to be more of a thriller <laughs> writer even though that's not right. what you want to do no i mean not actively but so like in December of 2019, you know, as the cloud of the pandemic was approaching, mm. you know, I, I just turned in Survivor Song and my, my editor was very happy. And uh, I was actually in New York City to do uh, a reading at, you know, Ellen Datlow's KGB reading series uh, mm. with Nathan Ballandrude. Um, and before the reading, you know, I had dinner with my editor and agent and Nathan and it was, it was fun. But, you know, she sort of just offhandedly talked about <laughs> – um, you know, talked about the previous two books and I don't know, it was just like, I just got the feeling I knew like the editing or the marketing side of things. And I hadn't told her about the Paul Bears club, but, but I tried to warn her there. It's like, Hey, you know, the next book is not going to be a thriller. Um, you know, it'll still be hopefully like scary and fun and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, I just don't think it's not going to have the, a thriller structure. And so fast forward like five months later, cause I was off deal. Um, you know, Survivor Song was the end of my previous book deal, so we had to pitch my, you know, pitch my editor again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, which is fine. You know, she, you know, we we both love working with each other, and we wanted to continue to do so. Yeah, you know, so I did. I turned in thirty pages in a, a summary. Yeah, you know, so the, you know, she knew early on what this was going to look like. You know, uh, and it certainly. I don't think if you read the summary, none of it says you know shouted thriller. Yeah, and yeah, so no, there was no real pushback on that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, not at all. There was never, like, the phrase, like, hey, this isn't a thriller, so we can't do this. Um, you know, I did tighten up the book a little bit, but it had to be tightened up. Um, not not, not having anything to do with, like, the marketplace or, or whether or not this was a thriller or not a thriller. Yeah, just for, for the sake of the story. There was, for as much of, <laughs> for as much as there's still, like, the slow burn, um, interior monologue, diatribe, <laughs> speeches at times you know there was probably you know those 30 pages that i cut out of this book um when, when i turned in the draft mm. and in terms of that format i mean i said before it's a found memoir it's mm -hmm. been found by mercy who is then essentially critiquing the story the memoir as we go along and almost kind of fact checking in a sense and being like whoa that's <laughs> not exactly how that happened but I, i'm wondering i mean how does one ensure that the form isn't a gimmick or the form doesn't undermine the story or perhaps put in a better way i mean how do you ensure that the form is not just an extension of the story but is part of its very essence yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? But that's a great way of putting it. You know, those are the things I, you know, had to ask myself and remind myself when I was writing the story. So I knew, you know, fairly early on, like for me, it was a little bit of like a logic experiment to like, oh, hey, this is a found memoir. Okay, who found it? Um, and once I knew the character that found it, it was like, well, you know, I knew that she was going to comment at the end of each chapter and she probably couldn't resist commenting. <laughs> within the margins itself. So, I mean, Mercy has, I mean, I think multiple roles within the story, aside from, you know, her character being very important. There's, ba you know, there's basically two unreliable narrators, you know, in this novel. Um, I think, honestly, one of her more important roles was to be there sort of like to cut Art's voice a little bit, you know, because mm. Art is, you know, very purposefully um, <laughs> melancholic, uh, maudlin, you know, I think clearly by the time he's an adult, you know, someone who's suffering from anxiety and depression as well. Um, and that's a little bit hard to take. Um, you know, some of the woe is me stuff that he indulges in. 
Mm. Um, I think if it was just his voice, I, I do think I would have had to have written him differently. Um, and Mercy was there, you know, not even to, to lighten things up a little bit, but also like to be there to call Art and his bullshit, um, to be hopefully like a little bit of a counterbalance, um, you know, within the narrative. You know, but also I hope that sort of relationship would become both more fraught and more poignant, you know, the deeper you get into the book. Um, yeah, so that aspect was super important to me. And again, I tried to warn my editor because I knew it was going to be a pain in the ass to publish, particularly in the physical format. Um, you know, so, I mean, I mentioned it obviously when we first pitched the book. And when I first turned in the book, she's like, ah, do we have to have the margin comments? And I said, yes, <laughs> they yeah. have to be there. Uh, and she didn't push back too much on it. And in fact, I mean, they went above and beyond in the physical book. You know, I, I never asked for red ink. Um, you know, I, I knew that was a, a cost that would be more, way more expensive. So that was, I was really blown away that they said, oh no, like you're, we're going to do the first print hardcover, uh, you know, red ink for, for Mercy's comments, which was really cool. Yeah. And just visually really adds another layer, adds more depth to the book. Yeah. I, yeah, definitely. I, I hope so. I mean, I thought I helped <laughs> in a weird way to get people to, you know, continue to turn those pages to see, because those red, <laughs> those red comments, and even if they're not red, like in the Titan version, uh, I think the Titan version does an amazing job too of, of, you know, they, they went the extra effort to really make uh, all the underlines and everything else look like they were actually handwritten. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it looks very natural. So, I mean, that certainly draws the eye. And, and I understand it takes a little bit of acclimation as a reader to, you know, to, to get used to that. But, you know, hopefully, you know, most are, mo for most people that it works for them. See, now you've let slip that the formatting is different in the Titan version. Maybe all those <laughs> hardcore Tremblay fans, they're like, well, we've <laughs> got to pick up that one as well, you know, to <laughs> yeah. see the visual difference. So... Yeah, do it, reader, and... Yeah, do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do it. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror Podcast with Paul Tremblay. We'll be back again next time for the second and final part of that conversation. But if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want to get every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early bird access to each and every episode, but you get to submit questions to the interviewee. And coming up soon, we've got Jonathan Jans, and we've got John Niven, an author that I absolutely love. So I'm really thrilled that we're going to be getting John Niven on the podcast for the first time. He has written a number of books, including Kill Your Friends, The Amateurs, and Straight White Male. And if you haven't read John Niven before, I think you should seek him out. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Tried and true are done to death. It was all a dream, an anthology of bad heart tropes done right. Revives even the most exhausted cliches with stories from some of Hart's biggest names, like Gemma Files, Gabinio Glacius, and Haley Piper. It was all a dream, an anthology of bad heart tropes done right. Available anywhere you buy books online. Use this code, This Is Horror, for 20% off through the month of October when you order direct from HungryShadowPress.com. Horror on Main, a new weekend convention for the horror community. Exploring all the shadows of horror, our guests include writers and actors, but also artists, publishers, directors, composers, and more. We've been going to cons for over 20 years and are changing up the little things to make the big picture amazing. Beyond guests, and contests, movies, panels, and podcasters, our layout and programming are designed to further incorporate the very idea of community. Join us Memorial Day weekend 2023 in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Come to the block party and meet your new neighbors. HorrorOnMain.com Now before I go, I just wanted to say another thing about the Patreon, and that is that at the moment we are doing NaNoWriMo. So if you're embarking on that or you're thinking, fuck it, let's just get into it right now, then do consider becoming a patron because you're going to be surrounded by a load of other people doing NaNoWriMo and supporting you through that. And of course, with Patreon, 
you can be part of a supportive community all year round. We've always got writing challenges. We're always egging each other on and wanting each other to do better. So it's just a really positive place. And, you know, it could be the place to be to take your writing to the next level and to find that writing community that you've been looking for. So do check it out, patreon.com forward slash this is horror, and see if it's a good fit for you. As always, I would like to end with a quote, and this is from the philosopher Seneca. As each day arises, welcome it as the very best day of all, and make it your own possession. We must seize what flees. I'll see you in the next episode for part two with Paul Tremblay. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.